Yeah, it's a lot of material. All right, so on our Jeopardy boards, so we got, like I said, two tabs. Um, so the first one there, so you got shoulder muscles, 500, elbow, hand, tissue, uh, oh, sorry, muscles and muscle tissue, uh, and then joints. And then on this board, you have more muscles and muscle tissue, and then a miscellaneous that didn't really fit in any other category. So kind of just random elbow questions or whatever else I got. So we'll start on my left. So Carissa, what do you want to go with? Category and points. Okay, joints for 100. All right, so what type of joint, so the stuff we covered last time, so like condyloid joint, pivot joint, et cetera, is the glenohumeral joint, and how many degrees of freedom does it have? So, oh yeah, I should explain the rules. So Carissa gets to go, if she misses it, then you guys get a chance to steal. If she gets it wrong, she loses points. And then if you choose to, like if she misses and, and Dane takes it and you miss it, then you lose points too. So you gotta be selective about when you steal. All right. Well, in terms of the type, you can probably offer a pretty good guess as far as what the glenohumeral joint is. Last time we covered, yeah, those, yeah. So like we talked about plane joint, hinge joint, etc. Okay, good. So it is a ball and socket joint. And then how many degrees of freedom does it have? All right. Good. Started off with a good one. All right, Dane, what are we going for? Uh, let's do joints for 200. Joints for two. All right, what type of joint is the carpometacarpal joint of the first finger? And then how many degrees of freedom does it have? Okay, it, is metal. it does have two degrees, yep, very good. All right, Courtney, what do you think? Um, let's go for we'll All right, name the four muscles of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. So, like I said yesterday, that's kind of that's one of the the things that makes this test difficult is like going from rotator cuff to carpal metacarpal of the first to um, you know talking about actin and myosin, changing gears. Okay. Good. All right. So, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Very good. So, the answers aren't on here. So you're obviously getting the answers right now. And then, whenever people watch the video, back to the back to the top. Hand for a hundred. Name the four bones that articulate at the radiocarpal joint. Okay. Trochanterium, yeah. Oh, yeah, you do. So what's the name of the joint? Uh, oh, radius. There you go. All right, good. So the radiocarpal joint then, the articulation between the radius and then the carpal bone. So there's three. 
that interact with the radius. And so you've got the scaphoid, the lunate, and the trochetrum. Primarily the scaphoid and the lunate, trochetrum kind of depends on wrist position. So all right, Dane. All right, name four muscles that are agonists for internal or medial rotation at the glenohumeral joint. Yep. Right. Well, one of the three so far was not correct, so that's okay. All right, so Courtney, you want to steal that one? You don't have to, but if you steal it and miss it, you lose points. But if you steal it and get it, you gain points. One of his was incorrect. He named three, one of the three was incorrect. Is that the pass on the steel then? Yeah. Okay. Carissa, you want that one? No. Nope. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rotators at the glenohumeral joint. So the subscapularis, one of the four rotator cuff muscles is. Pec major is. Latissimus dorsi, teres major, deltoid. Okay, so those are the big ones. So you, you mentioned pec minor, that's only a scapular muscle, so that's the one that you had identified incorrectly. All right. So to Courtney then. All right. The blank is the primary hinge joint of the elbow and the joint at which flexion and extension occur. Not that one. Close, but not that one. Uh, Carissa, you want that one? Okay. Dan, you want that one? Good. Humeral ulnar. Yep. So the humeral ulnar joint is the primary hinge joint of the elbow. Very good. All right, and then we're back to Carissa. All right, muscles and muscle tissue for 100. All right, in a blank contraction, the muscle shortens, and there's a change in the angle of the joint on which the muscle acts. Those are helpful to have groups. <laughs> yeah, we did spend four days on muscles. Yeah. All right, so let's open that up to anybody. Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Concentric is correct. Very good. So we'll change the rules a little bit rather than just taking turns. We'll just go, everybody can go at once. All right. 
So that was like probably day three of the muscles. Yeah. All right. So Dane, pick a category, and then anybody can answer. Um, what's on the other tab? Um, muscles and muscle tissue and miscellaneous. All right. How many degrees of freedom does the radiocarpal joint have? Two. Yep. Two is the correct answer there. So the wrist joint has two degrees of freedom because it can move in the sagittal plane and the frontal plane. To Courtney. So muscles and muscle tissue, miscellaneous, and then all those. Um, let's yeah, yeah, let's do that. All right, so if I've hurt my fourth finger and can no longer flex at the distal interphalangeal, DIP joint, which muscle have I injured? Yep, it's the one that's injured in that. <laughs> so if you have a jersey finger, which muscle is affected? <laughs> At least you remember we talked about it yesterday. <laughs> that's good. It's a good start. It is flexor digitorum profundus. Very good, yep. Flexor digitorum profundus. Nice. All right. Carissa, what are we going with? Um, elbow for two. Elbow for two. All right, so the radio ulnar joints, both proximal and distal, have blank degree or degrees of freedom. Two. Okay, two is incorrect. One is correct, because all you can do is supinate and pronate, right, at that joint. So remember, radial ulnar joints, supination, pronation there. And so in terms of degrees of freedom, it's one, because it only moves in one plane, which is the transverse plane. Nice. All right. And then to Dane. List three muscles that inserted the greater tubercle of the humerus. And as a hint, all three are rotator cuff muscles. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Good. Those are the three. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Subscapularis, the fourth muscle, inserts as a lesser tubercle. All right. So that was there. All right. Courtney? Tissue for two. List the three layers of connective tissue in a muscle from superficial to deep. Correct. Epimysium wraps around the whole muscle. Paramysium wraps around a fascicle, so a bundle of muscle cells. And then the endomysium wraps around an individual muscle cell. Nicely done. Uh, back to Carissa, right? Okay. Joints for three. <clears throat> All right. A blank is a joint where two bones, or parts of the same bone, are joined by hyaline cartilage, keyword there, while a blank is a joint where the two bones are joined by fibrocartilage. So we covered this last time on uh, Wednesday.
Good, so synchondrosis is a joint with hyaline cartilage connecting the two bones, and then a symphysis, kind of like a symphony, but a symphysis is where the two bones are joined by fibrocartilage. Very good. All right, to Dane. Um, shoulder muscles are five. Shoulder five. Bone big. All right, other than their role as agonists in abduction, internal rotation, and external rotation, why are the rotator cuff muscles important for the normal function of the shoulder? Uh, they keep it in place rather than dislocate. Okay, yep. So they provide that dynamic restraint. Certainly they do that. So one of the things I want you to know about that, so remember that the rotator cuff muscles, remember that they run really closely to the joint capsule. And so whenever those muscles contract, they're going to pull the uh, humeral head against the glenoid. And why that matters is remember that the deltoid is involved in basically every shoulder motion. And when the deltoid contracts, it's going to tend to slide the humerus up because it's going to pull its insertion at the deltoid tuberosity toward its origin there along the clavicle, the acromion, and the spine of the scapula. So that's going to close that subacromial space. So to prevent that upward slide, we have to first get a contraction of the rotator cuff muscles. They're going to hug the humeral head against the glenoid and be able to convert that into a roll. And then actually they also convert it into a downward slide. Yep, so they maintain that subacromial space. That's one of their important jobs. Good. All right, to Courtney. Um, can we go to the other one? Yep. Miscellaneous for, two. miscellaneous for two. List three agonists for downward rotation and two for upward rotation at the scapulothoracic articulation. You're on the right track so far. You only got to do one more for upward rotation. <laughs> it won't let me do that. It has to be on the front side of that paper because the back side are the glenohumeral muscles. So it should be the, sh yeah, so it should be the the shorter of the two sides or the smaller of the two tables, I think. Yeah, there it is. All right, so downward rotators include pectoralis minor, so pec minor, levator scapulae, rhomboid minor, and rhomboid major. So there were four possibilities there. The upward rotators, serratus anterior, and then traps sections two and four. Pretty good. And then back to Carissa. Okay. All else being equal, the primary determinant of the amount of tissue, tish, tension, sorry, a muscle can produce is blank. So what determines how much how much tension a muscle can generate, how strongly it contract can contract? Part of the reason this is on there is I'm not sure how much I emphasized it during the lecture. <laughs> but it is an important thing to know. Okay, good guess. Not that. Other thoughts? So the answer is cross-sectional area, also known as diameter. So how, how large a muscle cell is, if you have a bunch of really big muscle cells, you have a larger muscle. What is the Ideally, what is the primary mechanism of growth inside of that muscle cell? What makes it bigger after 12 weeks of lifting weights? Yep. 
So the microterrorists start a signaling cascade that causes us to make more actin and more myosin. And so as you make more actin and more myosin, you have more contractile proteins inside of each individual muscle cell. And so if each individual muscle cell has more contractile proteins, it can contract more strongly. It can generate more tension. So is the cross-sectional area, which again is effectively the diameter of the muscle. So a bigger muscles or a larger muscle is a stronger muscle. All right. To Dane. All right. This, this one's not worded the best, but I couldn't edit it after I saved it. In a muscle cell, blank binds to troponin C, pulling tropomyosin off of the binding sites on actin and allow myosin to form a bridge. What ion binds to troponin C is what? Good. Calcium. Good. My... So calcium itself, the reason I said the wording wasn't very good, calcium itself doesn't pull tropomyosin off, but it does bind to troponin C, and then troponin C pulls tropomyosin off. So that's why in rereading this this morning, I didn't like my wording. All right. Courtney. Other board. Um, can we do the elbow for three? Elbow for three. All right, at which joint or joints do pronation and supination occur? And then name two agonists for each. Good. Radio ulnar joints. Yep. So both proximal and distal. And then supinator. Okay. Okay. So for supination, we're going supinator and brachioradialis, which will work. And then also also biceps. So those are your supinators. And then give me two pronators. It does, yep. So brachioradialis will work. And then the pronator quadratus. Okay, pronator quadratus. And then don't forget about pronator teres. That's the one that's close to the elbow. That's the larger of the two pronators. So for supination, supinator, biceps brachii, brachioradialis, pronation, pronator teres, pronator quadratus, and then brachioradialis as well. All right. And then back to Carissa. All right, the tendons of what two muscles comprise the anatomical snuff box? Mm -hmm. That's good, good first step. <laughs> I can point at them. Yeah. I don't remember their names. Yeah, I can tell you where they are though. Second one's wrong. Uh, extensor pollicis longus. There you go. So the two muscles are extensor pollicis longus, which is the one that's closer to the back side of your hand, and then extensor pollicis brevis, which is the one that's closer to the palmar aspect or the anterior aspect of your hand. And then the abductor tendon runs right next to the brevis. All right. And then to Dane. Tissue for three. Blank are muscle precursor cells that lie under the basal lamina of the muscle fiber. When a muscle fiber is damaged, as, as, as after strenuous resistance training, these cells proliferate and play a key role in the repair of that cell. Satellite cells is the correct answer. All right. And then to Courtney. List the four actions for the trapezius muscle at the scapulothoracic articulation. Yep. 
Yep, Dane. Ooh, one of those is wrong. Chris, did you have your hand up? Okay. Uh, upward rotation, elevation. Good. So, four actions for the traps. We'll, we'll start at the top. Elevation, so section one does elevation. Section two does upward rotation and retraction. And then section three, straight retraction. Section four, upward rotation, or sorry, yeah, section four, upward rotation and depression. So broadly speaking then, elevation, retraction, upward rotation, depression. So not downward rotation is where, the, where that one went awry. Good, all right. And then to Dane. Blank stores and releases calcium, which is important in initiating the interaction of actin and myosin. So what organelle in the muscle cell stores the calcium and then picks it back up? Good, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is that organelle. Nice. All right, uh, Courtney. All right, list four muscles that originate at the lateral epicondyle and one action for each. Not that one. The other three are right. Did I say carbide radialis brevis? You did not, so that'll work for a fourth. And then what do they all do? Uh, okay, at. What's the anatomical name for your wrist joint? Good. All right, so lateral epicondyle muscles. So you've got extensor carpi radialis longus. It originates also up on the supracondylar ridge, but extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor digiti minimi, extensor carpi ulnaris. And all of them are radiocarpal extensors. Some of them, like extensor digiti minimi and extensor digitorum, do other things. But at the very least, they're all extensors at the wrist, which is the radiocarpal joint. Back to Carissa. With aging, articular cartilage is less able to repair itself, resulting in a gradual process of erosion that can lead to osteoarthritis. Why does this happen? 
And as a hint, like how are the chondrocytes in somebody who's 50 different than the chondrocytes in somebody who's 22? Yep. Okay, so as they age, the chondrocytes are less able to produce collagen, which is that primary constituent of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so you can't you can't build the the meshwork as well. So then, because you get damage to the collagen all the time, whenever you're walking or you know anytime that that joint's being compressed, you're damaging some of those collagen fibers. So you constantly have to be repairing them, and so those aging cartilage cells can't generate as much collagen, so they, they're not as good at repair, and so it starts to wear down. All right. And then what else happens to those chondrocytes? Or what else can't they make? Is probably a better way to ask that. Uh, good guess. So the osteocytes are mature bone cells. So they're related. They come from the same stem, uh, stem cells. Um, so, I'll just tell you the answer. The answer is, so remember glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs is the abbreviation we use for those? So remember what those are, are a combination of protein and sugars, and they're these long strings of sugars, and the important thing is they hang on to water. And so if you've got a bunch of GAGs in the extracellular matrix, that cartilage is able to really effectively hold water. Well, as cartilage cells age, they can't produce as many GAGs, and the ones they produce aren't as big. And so the effect is that the cartilage has less water content as we age, and so it's, it's just not as resilient. When you compress it, if there's a lot of water in it, it'll squish like a water balloon and come back to its original shape. If you lose that water content, it compresses and doesn't come back. So then you also can't repair the, the, um, the collagen fibers. So the combination of the two, basically the cartilage kind of thins and erodes, and then eventually you wear it down in certain spots with age. This is the one that actually has the answer. So in case you forget that later, the answer is up on that one. But none of the rest of them do. Uh, all right. Back to Dane. All right. Perform radiocarbal flexion and then list five agonists for that motion. Okay, so you're doing the action. So radiocarbal flexion is just wrist flexion, right? So bringing the palm of your hand closer to the anterior aspect of the front of your forearm. And then what are five muscles that do that? Okay. Two more possibilities. Good. All right. So there are the medial epicondyle muscles. So you got flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, palmaris longus, and then you have the two long finger flexors, flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. And then if you want to, you go flexor pollicis longus would work as well. Good. And then to Courtney. List four muscles that originate at the medial epicondyle and the actions for each. Well, based on the last question, it just got easier. Good. So, yeah, the radiocarpal joint. Good. Yeah. All right. So the the superficial ones are pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, and then the flexor digitorum superficialis also has part of its origin there as well. Everything other than pronator teres is a flexor radiocarpal. Pronator teres obviously is a pronator at the radio ulnar joints. Excellent. Carissa? Um, 
All right, so with respect to their tis tissue classification, tendons and ligaments are considered blank because their fibers, collagen, are their most prominent element and because the fibers are closely packed into bundles that run in the same direction parallel to the line of pull. So what type of connective tissue are tendons and ligaments? They are connected, but what type of connective tissue? Yep. Dense regular is the correct answer, yeah. So they're dense because there's not a lot of extracellular matrix, as opposed to like an areolar tissue, it's mostly water, most, mostly extracellular matrix. And then they're regular because all their fibers run in the same direction. So if there's a question about joint capsules, it's dense irregular because the fibers run in a bunch of different directions. So that's one of the key differentiators I want you to know. Good. And then Dane. <clears throat> Blank are responsible for synthesizing the specialized ground substance and fibrous proteins, including collagen and elastin, in tendons and ligaments. So what cells synthesize, um, let's just go with collagen, what cells synthesize collagen in tendons and ligaments? Uh, Good, fibroblasts, excellent. I didn't think anybody was going to get that one without multiple choice. Excellent. As opposed to in cartilage cells, it's primarily chondroblasts when you're younger, and then the chondrocytes are responsible for keeping up the matrix with age. All right. So to Courtney. If a muscle fiber were to suddenly and permanently stop producing ATP, the fiber would no longer be able to actively transport calcium out of the cytoplasm and into, uh, and sorry, and the intracellular calcium concentration would rise. What would you expect to happen? And this is probably more of a 500 point question. This one's pretty hard. <laughs> so if, if, if the muscle cell can't make ATP anymore, what's gonna happen in the muscle cell? And we see this, the, like the classic anatomy book example is shortly after an animal dies, what happens to it? in terms of its like posturing. Teresa, I feel like you know, that's a knowing look. No, okay. <laughs> they do. So this goes back to the part in the muscle chapter about the, the steps in terms of forming cross bridges between actin and myosin. So remember that as soon as those active sites on actin are exposed, myosin is going to jump up and attach and pull it toward the midline. But what do I have to do to get myosin to detach from actin? So you actually have to attach an ATP. And when you attach the ATP, that's going to cause it to detach from actin. We're going to break the ATP to reset that myosin spring, if you will. And so if you're not producing ATP, then myosin stays attached to actin. And so then the reason it's mentioned with dead animals, um, the condition is called rigor mortis, or rigor mortis, you've seen that before, you're, you're familiar with the term, I assume, that you know, animals, like when they're dead for a little while, they stiffen up, right? And that's because they've stopped producing ATP, and so you have just continued interaction of actin and myosin until the cell degrades and, and you stop getting that anymore. So if you don't produce ATP, myosin can't detach from actin is the, the takeaway there. Yeah, continued cross bridge interaction or cross bridge formation. All right, Courtney? All right, draw and explain a length tension curve. So I'll just tell you for the sake of time. So a length tension curve, so this is in that muscle chapter. At near the end of the muscle chapter, there's uh, slides about all the determinants of muscle force. And so the length tension curve is the one that looks like an upside down U. And so what it says is when a muscle is fully stretched out, it can't generate very much tension. So you're at the right side of that curve. You're at the right side of the U. And so why does that happen? Why is it when a muscle is fully stretched, it can't generate very much force? Or when a muscle is fully shortened, it can't generate very much force? What happens in the muscle cell? So. 
That's right. Deals with the interaction of actin and myosin. So when we fully stretch a muscle, so remember at, at normal resting length, actin and myosin are interdigitated. They're kind of overlapping, right? So, so you get kind of like your fingers overlapping. So that's resting length. So myosin has to be able to attach to actin and pull it toward the midline to cause the muscle to shorten. Well, if we stretch a muscle out here, myosin can't really attach to actin very effectively, so it can't generate very much tension. So if a muscle is fully lengthened, you just can't get very many cross bridges that form, so you can't generate much tension. When the muscle is fully shortened, then the myosin is going to bump up effectively against the Z lines, and so then you can't generate very much tension either. You can't go anywhere, basically as short as you're going to get. All right. Let's do 500. Draw and explain a force velocity curve. So the force velocity curve is the one that starts fairly high on the Y axis on the left side and then drops off down to the right. So force velocity curve, it's right after length tension curve on the slideshow. And remember the gist of it is if you're moving really fast, the muscle can't gener generate very much force. If you're moving really slow, the muscle can generate quite a bit more force. Why is that? When you're moving really fast, remember only the fastest of your type 2X fibers are actually able to generate any force on the tendon because they're able to fully contract and relax before the type 1 fibers ever catch up. So all the way on the right, it's only type 2X fibers, and as we slow down, then we're able to incorporate the 2As, they catch up, and then the type 1 fibers. So there's more muscle fibers involved when you're moving slower. All right, so that's it for that tab. And then we still got a few minutes left. So Carissa, which one do you want to go with? <coughs> And for five. All right, list five muscles that are agonists for radial deviation. And there's six possibilities. Okay, so the muscles that are agonists for radial deviation, so you have flexor carpi radialis, so they're all on the radial side of the forearm. So flexor carpi radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, and then all the thumb muscles. So there's actually seven possibilities. So extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis longus, and then flexor pollicis longus. So any of those. So you got a lot of radial deviators. Some more powerful than others, like the, the two primaries are flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor, or sorry, extensor carpi radialis longus, but there are several other assisters. All right, Dane. Describe two ways we can modulate the amount of tension developed by a muscle. Uh oh. So, like, if I don't know how. The example I gave in class is like if you're helping somebody move and they're like, can, can you go pick up that box of pillows over there? And the box is sealed, you can't see how much weight's in there. And you go to pick it up and it turns out it's a box of textbooks, right? And so when you, when you thought it was pillows, you applied a little bit of force, but that's not enough to overcome the resistance. And so you, you need to generate more force. How do you do that? There's two ways. And you're, you're going to do both at the same time, depending on your level of training. Short answer, so the two terms I'm looking for, motor unit recruitment and rate coding. Remember that motor units deal with an alpha motor neuron and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. We start with our small motor units, so our type 1s, and if that's not enough tension that we're able to generate to overcome the resistance, then we recruit our type 2As and then our type 2Xs. So it works on the size principle, start small, work up to big. And then the other thing is rate coding, which is how many times per second does that alpha motor neuron depolarize? So the frequency of firing, if you will, or the frequency of depolarization. Because the more times per second the alpha motor neuron depolarizes, the more it's sending acetylcholine across that synaptic cleft, the more consistently the muscle cell depolarizes, which then leaves calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allows for continued interaction of actin and myosin, provided we're still producing ATP, which we will be because we're still alive. So short answer, motor unit recruitment rate coding. Courtney, which one of the fives? Uh, joints. Okay. List and describe five characteristics of, of synovial joints. Easy.
Short answer, joint space, joint capsule. Remember the capsule has two layers, a synovial layer on the inside or deeper, and then a fibrous layer. Um, so those are the big ones. Then you also have hyaline cartilage, you have synovial fluid, and then around the joint you may have fat pads, you may have bursa, and then there are a few other things in there as well. Ligaments, um, which may be extracapsular, intracapsular, or uh, capsular. So those are the big ones. There's probably one or two I left off, but the main one I want you to know, so joint space, joint capsule, those are the big two really. And then the last one, oh, <laughs> saved a hard one for last. All right, so starting with the receipt of acetylcholine at the muscle cell, describe the events of muscle excitation and contraction in the muscle cell. So there's a couple questions on there that are ordering questions where it asks you to, like, here's four events, put them in order. So you have to kind of drag them around and put everything in order. So there's one diagram that I showed you um, that has the motor inflate, has the end of the alpha motor neuron, and it has the... Um, where it interacts with the muscle cell. And there's a number of steps that happen there. I think it's figure 9.1. So be familiar with that. It's on the, the review sheet. There's a Word document that's up as a review sheet. Um, so it's on that. So be familiar with that. And then I, I give you the slide number for the, the other half of that and be familiar with that as well.